When I speak to a room of people and I ask them how many are addicted, most people will only think of drugs, so some people put their hand up. Then I give them my broader definition of addiction and not everybody puts their hand up. You say all drugs and all behaviors of addiction, substance dependent or not, whether gambling, sex, the internet or cocaine, all of them either soothe pain directly or distract from it. Hence your mantra, the first question is not why the addiction, but why the pain? Uh, and I think that beautifully sums it up. Mm. Um, you know, in, in that you, you're, liking, you're likening addiction to drugs, potentially to, you know, sex, gambling, alcohol, maybe shopping. Well, um, so I've had my own shopping addiction and I can tell you that the, what happens in my brain when I'm indulging in my shopping addiction is exactly the same that happens in the brain of the cocaine addict. In other words, there's an excitation of the reward, incentive, and motivation circuitry. And what the addict is after is that temporary change in brain status. Really what it is, all addictions are an attempt to regulate an unbearable emotional state internally. But you're trying to regulate your internal state through external means. And that's what an addiction is. So temporarily you get a change in the state of your brain, in a change of your physiology. You can do that through drugs. You can also do it through gambling or internet or sex or shopping. But essentially after that same revitalization of your incentive and motivation circuitry of your brain. And so from my perspective, there's only one universal addiction process that dominates all addicted people. The targets of addiction may be different. The internal effects are much the same. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry, I should add, when you look at the, 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 the sources of it, the states that people are trying to escape are states of emotional distress, states of emotional pain, and hence, why the addiction? Not why the addiction, but why the pain? So some people who are listening to this or, or watching this right now <coughs> might be thinking, yeah, I get that, that, that all sounds fine. Um, for those people who are addicted, but I, of course, am not addicted to anything. So you've, you've got a rather beautiful definition, I think, of addiction, which I think will be really helpful to sort mm -hmm. of go through at the start here so that people listening can actually figure out if it does relate to them or not. Well, when I speak to a room of people and I ask them how many are addicted, most people will only think of drugs. So some people put their hand up. Then I give them my broader definition of addiction, and not everybody puts their hand up. And that definition is that an addiction is manifested in any behavior that a person finds temporary pleasure or relief in and therefore craves, but suffers negative consequences in the long term and is going to be able to give it up. So any behavior, not just drugs. The key hallmarks are craving, pleasure, relief in the short term, negative outcomes in the long term, inability to, to give it up. That's what an addiction is. And that could be to drugs, uh, nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, the legal, the lethal and legal substances, or it could be to uh, heroin, cocaine, crystal meth, fentanyl, cannabis, any number of other substances. But it could also be to sex, to gambling, to shopping, to eating, to work, to exercise, to the internet, to gaming, to pornography, to political power, to the acquisition of wealth, to the hoarding of objects, anything. And, by, and when you give that definition and you ask people how many here would acknowledge some addiction in their life, sometimes the vast majority of people would put their hands up, which means to say that addictions are on a continuum, it's on a spectrum, and they're distributed, dispersed throughout all of our society. And so that the identified drug addicts make up only a small, narrow segment of our addicted population. So really the whole way we, we think about addiction, the way we criminalize various forms of addiction, really needs to change to a much more, a more compassionate way of dealing with it, but also really trying to understand what's the root cause. Because if, you know, I totally subscribe to your theories and I, and, I, and I think that ultimately, if the root cause of all addiction or all addictive behavior is the same, you know, how do we tackle that? And where does that come from? What is that root cause? So, once you're asking not why the addiction, but why the pain, now you have to forget that it's a choice because nobody chooses to be in pain. Mm. 
And you also have to forget the medical idea that it's an inherited brain disease. You actually have to look at people's lives. Now, in Vancouver's downtown east side in Canada, where I worked for 12 years, with a highly addicted population, these people had uh, multiple addictions, cocaine, alcohol, uh, cannabis, uh, opiates of all kinds, cigarettes in every case. They suffered with HIV, with hepatitis C. They would die of overdoses, suicide, um, infections of all kinds. And these people, every single one of them had been heavily traumatized in childhood. All the women I worked with over 12 years had been sexually abused. All the men had been neglected or beaten or emotionally abused. I'm talking about now the severely addicted population, which is also what the large-scale study shows, that the, the greater the childhood adversity, the greater the risk for addiction in adulthood. Now, the more severe the childhood adversity, the greater the risk of substance addiction and injection use. However, if you look at my own case, um, I wasn't beaten, I wasn't abused in my family of origin, um, I wasn't neglected, but I was a Jewish infant born during the war in Hungary um, and spent my first year under the Nazi, Nazi regime. You can imagine under what circumstances. So I had a very unhappy, stressed, terrorized mother. And children can be hurt in two ways. Children, begin, children can be hurt when bad things happen to them that shouldn't happen. That's the abuse, that's the violence in the family, that's the parental addiction. But children can also be hurt when their needs are not met. Now, I had this need for an attuned, empathetic, emotionally responsive mother. She couldn't be that. <clears throat> not because she didn't love me, not because she didn't do her best, but simply she was too terrorized, she was too depressed. The lack of that joyful, attuned, loving mother who, I, I shouldn't say loving because she loved me tremendously, but her love couldn't be translated into responsive behavior. That alone was enough to hurt me. So in other words, the source of addiction is always some kind of a childhood hurt, either because bad things happen that shouldn't have, or because the good things that should have happened couldn't happen because of the parents' emotional states. Both of these are enough to hurt the child uh, in a way to driving them to self-soothe through addictions. So, so do you think your own experience of trauma, really, yeah. uh, uh, as, a, as a young baby, not even yeah. a child, as a young baby, yeah. has impacted your own health, your own behaviors, and therefore ultimately where you are today, which is one of the world's leading voices on trauma and addiction, do you think that has been instrumental in you getting to where you are today? Having to deal with the impacts of that has been instrumental. I mean, I really, uh, as an adult, uh, I was a successful physician. You know, I was much in demand, a uh, family practitioner. I was head of a palliative care department at a major hospital. I was a national medical columnist for a Canadian newspaper in my 50s. And internally, I was driven, workaholic, depressed, uh, affected by ADHD, um, anxious, and unfulfilled and unsatisfied. And it's when looking at those dynamics and wondering, well, what the heck has happened to me here? And what is the gap between my external persona and my internal experience of myself? That's when I began to deal with trauma. Uh, not to mention, as a family physician, and you and I were talking about this before, we get to see patients before they get sick. The specialists only see them after the illness has been diagnosed. I get to see people before they get ill. I get to see people in their context of their multi-generational family background. So we have a much broader view of who gets sick and why. And so both through my medical work and having to deal with my own stuff, I began to realize the central role of trauma in shaping people's health or illness. Yeah, since I've, since I've been studying trauma myself, um, both with the work that you do, but just other things that I'm reading around it, it really helps me understand my patients mm -hmm. and their behavior is much better. I really start to, you can start to tap in now as to what they're coming in with the more you think, oh, that's what's going on behind that. Not the symptom they're describing, but, but why are they making those choices? And some of you may not know, Gabe, I, I, a few years ago, I did um, a series of documentaries on BBC One called Doctor in the House. And what I would do on that is I went to live alongside families who had, 
health problems. Mm. They were already under GPs, they were already under specialists, they were all taking medication pretty much already, and they still weren't getting better and they were still struggling. So I went in to, sometimes I'd stay the night in their houses, I'd live mm. alongside them, really get to understand you know, what choices they were making with their lifestyle, sure, but also I'd get to see you know, various dynamics in the family, the sort of thing that would never come up in the consultation room. Even if you ask that question, they would never even think to bring those things up. And you would just start to spot things and, and little dynamics. And I found that with every single family, pretty much now, if I, f if I reflect back on all those families I stayed alongside, I was very fortunate to get really good health outcomes with them all after about six weeks. Mm. But there was a huge emotional component behind a lot of the illness. Yeah. Um, now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that it was in their head at all. They had proper physical symptoms that were that they were struggling with. And obviously that in some ways can make people feel down a little bit about themselves because they're not feeling so good. But I really got this strong sense that when you start to look at their lives and their upbringing and how they saw themselves, it, it was just it was uncanny how many times their emotional health was absolutely tied into their physical health. Well, so one of the books I've written, which will be published in Britain in a few months, is entitled When the Body Says No, The Cost of Hidden Stress. And I'm making the case, precisely as I heard you articulate just now, is that when it comes to chronic illness, and whether it's colitis or Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, ALS, or, or motor neuron disease in, in England, uh, malignancy, um, chronic psoriasis, eczema, chronic fatigue syndrome, the physiological symptoms, which are not in people's heads in the sense that they're imagining them, but it very much originates in people's heads in that it has a lot to do with certain relational and emotional patterns that they adopted in childhood. In other words, what I'm saying is that because of childhood programming, people impose certain unconscious stresses on themselves, and those stresses because of the unity of mind and body, which unfortunately is not taught or recognized in the medical schools, but which scientifically is not even vaguely controversial, because the immune system and the emotional apparatus and the hormonal apparatus and the nervous system are part and parcel of the same system. So when something occurs emotionally, which it does on a chronic basis, that has an impact of undermining people's physiology, turning their immune system against themselves or suppressing the immune system. So. I absolutely agree that people's emotional patterns, which reflect not individual choices or mistakes, but multi-generational patterns in the family, those emotional patterns translate into physical illness. And, 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 and if we can address those emotional dynamics, we can actually have an impact on the physiological course of their illness, which is again not something that anybody in medical school will ever tell you because there's this unfortunate separation of mind and body that you and I are trained in. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think the key, one of the key things there for me was that you're not putting blame on people. There's no blame. Yeah, and I think that's really, really a key point to, that maybe we can discuss now because a lot of people may be hearing that feeling, you know, maybe I've done this to myself or my mother did this to me, for example, uh, and that's not what you're saying at all, is it? Well, um, this is an interesting conversation. I make the distinction between blame and responsibility. Okay. Blame says that you did something that you could have done otherwise, and so you're, therefore you're at fault. That's what blame says. Responsibility says, yes, you do this to yourself, but not consciously or deliberately. You did it because you're programmed to do it by your own childhood experience, which in turn was uh, um, mm, programmed by your parents' childhood experience. So there's nobody at fault, everybody does their best, but we do pass these unconscious patterns on. And you don't blame people for having unconscious patterns, you try to make them conscious of it so they can take responsibility for it. So there's no, con there's no responsibility without consciousness. Yeah. And, so, and, and there's no blame. So I don't blame anybody for their illness, I don't blame their parents either. But I do say these unconscious patterns have been passed on and these unconscious emotional dynamics have an impact on your physiology. That's all. And if you want to have an impact on your physiology, you've got to get conscious. You have to realize what have you been doing unconsciously so you can stop doing it or do it differently. So it's a matter of liberating people from these ingrained patterns for which they're not to be blamed. So in my world, there's no room for blame whatsoever. 
but there is room for helping people to become responsible, for helping people being response-able, being able to respond to their circumstances. And without awareness, none of us are response-able. Yeah, I think if I think to my own life and my own health journey over the last few years, and I guess what's really changed for me over the last few years, you know, I've done a lot with my lifestyle, I've done yeah. a lot with my nutrition, my sleep, and, and those things have been great and they've really helped me. But over the last few years, I've really been focused on my emotional health. You know, okay. I, I, I see a therapist pretty regularly. Um, and I can always feel when I've got something new, some, some deeper layer that's starting to come out. You know, I, I, have, I have a session or I, I go through some sort of therapy and I, I feel good. I feel, oh, yeah, you know, I've, I've got it now. I get it. I get it why I do this. And, and it changes your behavior, certainly. But it's almost as, a, as if you, as you do that, there's multiple layers. It's like peeling back a layer of the, you know, it's peeling back layers of the onion and newer things keep coming out, um, which has been... It's been really rewarding for me because, you know, you talk about addiction and I, I think back to my, my own life and various things that I've done at certain points. You know, I don't think anyone who knows me well, uh, maybe my close friends, but, but, yeah. but most people probably wouldn't think that I've ever had an addiction because we yeah. have all these connotations about addiction. You know, you know it's like, you know, being, a, being on a street corner yeah. or being a drug yeah. addict or something. Yeah. But, but everyone around me would know that I've got an addicted personality. Yeah. And I used to think that that was my personality. That's the way I was born. What's yeah. weird, that as I start to process my own emotional baggage and I start to clear it, I'm no longer as an addictive person as I used to be. And, and that's why I really, I kind of feel, I feel so strongly about the work that you're doing because I kind of feel that that wasn't my personality. That was the behavior I had chosen to soothe something that I was missing. And well, so what I, how would I would put it? I, I mean, I, I agree with your concept. I would use, use a different language around it. Sure. That was your personality, but it wasn't your person. It wasn't who you were. The personality itself is a defensive structure that we develop as a way of dealing with our pain. So much of what we consider to be a personality is actually um, an overlay uh, upon our two selves. And so these weren't choices in childhood. For example, um, with my ADD, the tuning out. I never chose to tune out, but when I was an infant under the conditions that I've described of being a Jewish infant under the Nazis, I had plenty of stress on me. And how does an infant deal with stress that they can't change? They tune out. And then the tuning out becomes programmed into my brain. And then so many years later, I'm diagnosed with ADD. It wasn't a choice that I made, it was an adaptation. So I would, what I would say about the personality, including what you described as your addictive personality, it wasn't you, it was an adaptation that you took on as a way of surviving your childhood, as a way of soothing your pain. It's when we get older that we realize that there's something more to us than a personality, that the personality is actually a defensive cover for who we truly are. And as we start, like as you describe your own process, you go through therapy and you go through layers and then you realize, oh, that's not actually me, yeah. and, and I'm freer without it. Then you realize that what we thought was the personality was actually just a defensive cover. Uh, and, and once we strip that defense off and we find it no longer necessary, we become much more true to ourselves, more, much more true to ourselves, so we become much more balanced and happier in our lives. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do think about one thing that you can take and apply into your life. Inspiration is not enough, you need to take action. If you did enjoy that, please do press subscribe, hit that notification bell, and why not check out this conversation that I picked out that acts as the perfect follow-up.